be from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Uh, and so, go ahead, Professor, please. Uh, do I have the access to share the screen? Yes, yes, yes. I do. Okay, I think you are now watching the... Yeah, Can you confirm that you're watching the... <laughs> the my, my talk the yeah with the year. okay so uh thank you alberto for and um, uh, well uh, by extension the rest of the organizer for for this invitation and and it's a real pleasure to be here in my office but sharing my thoughts uh, <laughs> about the topological system uh, with you well and my thoughts about the, this topological stuff today are, is going to be related to whole viscosity in three-dimensional topological semi-metal. So, um, as I said, this is the outline of, of, of this talk. So, uh, first, I want to, to, to show what I know about viscosity in classical systems, and in particular in classical and electron fluid. And in particular, I will pay attention to what is known called the whole viscosity. It's a term in, in the viscosity uh, response of system. So and we'll see why is this in, in, interesting in this context of, of uh, topological systems. I'll introduce uh, this uh, viscosity in a somewhat different way as we are used to, to do, as we, say, uh, we saw in the in previous talk, the, these previous days. And I'm gonna do in a, in a way more um, solid, state, solid state way. I want to say by the high energy physics by introducing strain in a more conventional type binding approach. And I'm gonna do what I, particularly in, in the case of bi metal to see what, I, what is equal or what is different, what to expect in, the, in this case of these bi metals. By extension, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna apply this method to find a whole viscosity in other three dimensional topological semi metals. And if I have time, Hopefully I do. Uh, I'm gonna extend. I want to extend this notion of viscosity to to all the uh, to optical phonons, which is not not clear. It's not equal, but we can learn draw some lessons uh, from, from this. Okay. So what is the viscosity? Well, all we know from undergrad that the the basic equation of motion in continuum mechanics is uh, this one. This is essentially the equivalent of the of the new uh, second Newton's law in in continuum mechanics, well, we can describe the, the the dynamics of the system in terms of a velocity field v as a response of a gradient of the what is called the stress tensor, okay, which is the the internal response of the of the of the uh, continuum system to 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 this fluid velocity. And also, when we we apply external forces, for instance, some electric fields in the case of, of charged fluid or you know, changes in the in pressure. Okay, uh, this this equation is is valid for for solids, and it's also valid for fluids when the Reynolds number, which is uh, is, is much smaller than one, so say when this there's an advective term in the in the derivative in the time derivative here, then we can neglect in this under this. Uh, these uh, assumptions, uh, but the Reynolds number are much smaller than one. In this case, this equation is valid for fluid and for solid. In the case of solid, we can describe the, these dynamics in terms of the velocity of changes in the momentum, essentially, also by changes in the in the in the position of the particles. Because uh, in a solid, it makes sense to to describe the position of a solid as a displacement from from the from the equilibrium position. Okay, something that Characterizes uh, solids or this this uh, this elastic response is the, essentially the generalization of the Hox, the Hooke's law, which is comes from the definition of the uh, uh, from the um, elasticity tensor. Okay, so essentially you 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 assume that your stress tensor is in linear response proportional to the stress tensor the st the strain tensor sorry, which is essentially the derivative of the of the position of the particle. This uh, linear response, this Hooke's law, can be divided in this one: this this uh, elasticity tensor, this four rank tensor, and this viscosity tensor, which is essentially the, something similar, but now is a response of the time derivative of the strain and how not how the system is is, is strained, but how fast or how 
uh, how slow it is straight. Okay. Perhaps it's not the best way to, to think on those systems, but this is helpful if we fully transform this equation and write in terms of frequency and momenta. If we do uh, so for, for these equations, we see that uh, essentially this, this uh, elastic uh, or this, um, this dynamical response of, uh, for solids is essentially a harmonic damped driven oscillator. So it's, it's harmonic because they, they, this uh, elasticity, elasticity tensor acts like a, like a restoration force, okay? Viscosity acts as a damping term in the in the in this dispersion relation and of course there is a force a standard force this is why this is harmonic damp and driven sorry so um for for liquid for linear liquids when the, we can in the, under the assumption that Reynolds number much smaller than one things are a bit things are a little bit different so we cannot properly define a position although it's useful when deriving this equation but that means that we write all the dynamics in terms of the velocity of the of the fluid. Also, these fluids in general uh, has a, a zero or very negligible uh, restoration force, so they do not react to the to the to the formation, okay, to the elastic deformation. So this is why the, the first term we usually encounter is this viscosity term, and as usual we have this gradient of, of, of pressure and all the external forces. If we do the same, we fully transform this this equation. We see that the, the the equation of motion, the the dynamics is a little bit rather different from the counterpart for solids. So it's essentially a diffusive term, the viscosity, instead of being just a, a damping in the in this harmonic oscillator term, it's just a diffusion term. Of course, the system is driven by standard forces. So although uh, of course this viscosity term now is proportional to the diffusion constant in the system. I said that this is not perhaps the best way to to think on fluid because now we know that things are more complicated. For instance, this uh, this uh, uh, fluid, this hydrodynamic description on in in fluid has been extended for quite a long time ago, from the 60s in in Russia, as I uh, This uh, this hydrodynamic description has been proposed in to to happen in in, in electronic liquids in metals. Uh, under very specific uh, and very special conditions, for instance, for ultra keen samples where the momentum relaxing mean free path, uh, essentially the, the characteristic length uh, ca that ca characterizes the, the relaxation, the momentum relaxation in the system is much, much larger than, for instance, the, the size of the system or Properly speaking, this momentum conserving interaction leads a mean free path much shorter than any other scale. And in those circumstances, you can describe uh, everything in terms of this, uh, essentially, the, this equation, the hydrodynamic equation. And uh, there are some consequences for that. For instance, that uh, the fluid uh, only stops the, the motion, only it relaxes momentum through the walls of the, of the sample. And through this viscosity, this uh, momentum relaxation propagates through the entire sample. Okay, so the larger the or the smaller the, the viscosity term, the larger is the velocity the, that and the, uh, therefore the current flowing in the in the middle of the of the samples. And uh, from some time ago, this was considered not to be able to be possible in 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 context matter samples, but now people is experimental people. Is able to grow extremely clean samples in the in the ultra clean in the ultra clean limit at under very very low temperatures. So, uh, they there are some experimental reports claiming that this uh, this uh, hydrodynamic regime has been uh, can be observed in some samples. But this is it's, a, it's not a bi metal. For instance, in, in some samples of um, transcend detail, right? It, it has been measured this this profile that can be found in this uh, in this reference. Also, it's important that uh, the resistivities of the system, because essentially the, what, uh, what the experimentalists do is to measure resistivities, the resistivities can be related to these viscosities. And in particular, the transfer resistivity, or you want the, for, for now on the whole resistivity, can be related also to the, what is called this uh, whole conductivity, some uh, anti-symmetric part of the, of the viscosity, viscosity tensor. So let me uh, go a little bit uh, deep into this, this uh, viscosity stuff. Um, 
because uh, it happens that this viscosity uh, is turns out to be a topological invariant in, in some uh, quantum electronic uh, gap system. So first of all, first of all, let me say that this uh, stress tensor is the space space component of the energy momentum tensor. Okay, so and as I told you, this viscosity is a four rank tensor that which is proportional to the time derivative of the strain. As any tensor in, in general can be decomposed in some symmetric part, symmetric in the sense that it can be, it doesn't change sign when you exchange pairs of, of indices. Okay, and this is, yeah, you can see that you don't change sign when you interchange these two indices, these two pairs of indices, and some anti-symmetric part with I gonna denote by H as a whole, when it acquires some extra sign when you interchange these uh, pairs of indices. Well, in, in, in general, we, your system is uh, rotationally invariant. Uh, the only uh, uh, tensor to in, ten, the irreducible tensor you have, uh, which is invariant under, under rotations, is the in general the, the delta uh, the delta tensor. So the symmetric part can be constructed in terms of products of this delta. Term. So in, in general, for for d-dimensional system, which is our are, which are invariant under rotation, the, we can define in general two viscosities: wall shear visco or viscosities, which is essentially the resistance of a system to to make a, a changes in the volume that preserve the changes in the in the system that preserve the volume, and there is some another coefficient which is called ball viscosity, which essentially is the resistance of the system to make changes in the volume. Okay. So if we now focus on this anti-symmetric part of, the, uh, of this, um, well, in this case, in the, in the, both in the symmetric and anti-symmetric part, it's easy to see that the, we can compute essentially the, 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 the energy produced, the, the work produced when, when you induce some strain in your system, which is essentially the this product of this viscosity times the, the strain tensor. And you can compute also from, from this work the variation of the entropy with respect to time. If you do, if you do that, you can see that essentially the, 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 the entropy production, which is the, the rate of change of the entropy, is proportional to the viscosity times two, two, two times the, the, the time derivative of the string tensor, okay? And now it's, it's simple. If you consider the symmetric part of this, uh, of this uh, viscosity, you will see that the, the symmet because this is this is a product of two equal uh, tensors, this uh, symmetric part will contribute to the entropy. So essentially, the, the the symmetric part of the of the viscosity is dissipative. But as you all know, uh, if we consider that the part which is anti-symmetric because we are contracting it with two equal uh, tensors, this one automatically vanishes. So essentially, this anti-symmetric uh, a hold or anti-symmetric viscosity is non-dissipative. So it doesn't produce entropy, okay? And uh, it is, uh, uh, is odd under, under inversion symmetry. For instance, in, in 2D system, you can see a two-dimensional system which is invariant under rotation. Uh, in, this, in, the, in, in, uh, in an equal way that you can construct uh, from the delta, the chronic delta of a tensor, the symmetric part, from the anti-symmetric part, you have two tensors, essentially the delta and the levity beta symbol with two indices in two dimensions, okay? So with that, the only combination you can get respecting the, those symmetries, the, the, the anti-symmetric uh, with, with respect to a change of indices is, is this one, okay? So you can read this uh, in this very nice review. Essentially in two-dimensional um, rotational invariant systems, there is only a single, it's possible to get a single uh, coefficient, which is the whole viscosity. And it turns out that this, this whole viscosity, this, this coefficient, is a, is a topological invariant that is topologically quantized in, in quantum system in two dimensions in a similar fashion as it happens with the whole conductivity. Actually, it's, it's, it's very instructive to, to think on, on, on this uh, whole conductivity when comparing with this whole viscosity. Because in a sense, the origin of, of both effects, the whole viscosity and the whole conductivity, comes from the essentially applying the Hellman and Feynman theorem, 
that tells you that if you have a system that depends on the set of parameters, the node by x. So the time, the, the expectation value of the of the derivative of the of the energy with respect to those parameters is essentially the derivative of the energy with respect to, with respect to those parameters. And there is an extra term that if those parameters depend on time, there is a connection. Okay. If we apply this to the to the whole conductivity, for instance, if we set this x uh, element as the component of the of the momentum. We, we get some very familiar results. So essentially the, this derivative with respect to the momentum is nothing but the velocity operator and the expectation value is essentially the, um, the group velocity, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to momentum, plus the recurvature times the, the time derivative of the, of the momentum. Okay, and we know that the expectation value of the, mom, of the time derivative of the momentum is necessarily uh, uh, forces in in the case that we don't have a magnetic field it's essentially the electric field and when we apply all this together from this very curvature we get this uh, whole uh, conductivity as we know because the, essentially the current is proportional to this to the expectation value of the velocity now if, instead of this momenta uh, we consider other other parameters like for instance uh, uh, the string tensor as I say, we are we are studying the how the system reacts to to local change of coordinate represented by the straight the, the string tensor. Okay, so you can apply the same formalism and you can compute this uh, expectation value, which is nothing by the expectation value of the, the stress tensor as the derivative of the energy with respect to the component of the string tensor, whatever it is. And if the string tensor depends on time, there is another very curvature in the same way that. Uh, the very curvature found when we consider momenta. And if you go to the literature and it's a, it's a very good and extremely fruitful to, uh, topic, you can say that this very curvature is as quantized as is the, the very curvature for, uh, for, for the case of momenta and this uh, topological imbalance. Uh, the technical details uh, to see this uh, essentially go beyond what I want to, to tell you in this in this uh, in this talk. But essentially, what Abron and co-workers did is just to consider a system, a couple essentially, and to put the system in a in a torus, okay, and consider a small deformation of the torus. Essentially, they introduce local coordinate deformation. What essentially did is just to couple electrons to a cast space-time background, and it essentially makes sense because the, the what I if you remember what I told you at essentially what machine said yesterday, the stress tensor is the phase space part of the energy momentum tensor. And we know that this energy momentum tensor naturally couples to the to the metric in a car space time. So from from this reference, from this time and and in the subsequent years, people have paid a lot of attention. In capping electrons to Karp space times in order to compute the different uh, uh, whole viscosities. So essentially, is so you have a, a, the, the 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 way to proceed is you have some, some electron system, and you want to couple uh, this electron system to 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 a Karp space background to compute the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor. Okay, first question: How do how do fermions couple to gravity? Okay, if the system is non-relativistic, it's Galileo invariant, you promote this Galileo invariance to local Galileo invariance, and essentially you promote from this non-relativistic uh, 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 Hamiltonian, you promote uh, uh, this to Karp space by introducing this uh, metric tensor right here. If you are Lorentz Lorenz invariance, like uh, bile or direct fermions in, in, in higher energy physics or more in, in condensed matter systems in bile semi-metals, and since you can postulate the, the local Lorentz invariance introducing this uh, uh, the field binds and this uh, spin connection is that was introduced in, at the at the beginning of this workshop. And what then if you accept these two action, these two ways of gravity coupling to, to fermions, then you can do two things, or you can integrate out fermions and construct an, some kind of effective field theory in terms of these. Uh, emergent fields, the, the spin connection, or the, these field binds, and you end up with some terms in the in this effective field theory. 
the coefficient of this effective field theory are the viscosity, or this is the Wenzel term. This which is the coefficient is the famous shift vector, and also you consider this this uh, effective field theory for these tetrads, you get this torsional whole viscosity that uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, two days ago. Also, what you can do is just to take this uh, those formalism and consider that your metric is just essentially the flat matrix, the one we are used to to use. And plus some small deformation and expand all these actions in terms of this small metric and whatever it couples at the end of the day to this, uh, to this perturbation is essentially the metric tensor. And you can use cubo formalism to compute the correlation function with this uh, metric tensor, whatever it is. So this is the way to compute the, this, um, this metric tensor. Well, what happens now in condensed matter? We are getting more and more familiar every day with new, new, new form, new avatars of, of, of fermions. For instance, in the case of Lipschitz fermions, uh, which are essentially a kind of mixture between log Galileo and Lorentz invariants, you say you are like by uh, linear in momentum in some direction, but you are quadratic in, in, in others. As I say, you have to invent how those fermions, how this theory. A couples to, to gravity and people uh, succeed in, in this. So I, I want to remark this, this paper by Copetti and Landsteiner when they, uh, they constructed from first principles a la high energy physics, I mean, the, this, how this, this lifts its fermion coupled to gravity. And as I say, with this, this theory, and also let me point out in this, uh, this latest paper, you can compute or use an effective field theory or QA formats, you can compute the the whole viscosity of this term. So I encourage you to just to visit this paper, which is, is, is really good to, to read. But what happens now? We, we know that we are other things, other beasts, which are the multiple fermions, for instance, that we have no idea yet how those, those fermions couple to, to gravity. So perhaps we have to do similar things as the people did with Lipschitz fermion and, and see how those multiple fermions couple to gravity. And well, I don't know if this is possible. But what is important is two subtleties that I want to, to highlight here. First is that using this, this uh, capping to remember what we want to do is just to compute the viscosity tensor in terms of, of uh, local deformations. And the way we need to do that is capping to, to, um, to uh, space time, cast space time background. But this is this approach uh, assumes some low energy and low wavelength effective field theories uh, to couple to space time, but from some reasons that uh, perhaps I can explain later, many of these coefficients might be UV dependent. So they might, be, might depend on, on cutoffs. For, this is the case, for instance, uh, that uh, we, we heard two days ago about this torsional anomaly that the, the coefficient is, is proportional to this uh, ultraviolet cutoff. So in principle, is not totally satisfactory to work with this low energy effective field theory because we need some information about the high energy completion. And also it's something I wanted to point out is that is what I said that we want to compute viscosities through expectation of values of the uh, stress tensor. It doesn't mean that we need uh, uh, fermions to be really coupled to, to, to Karp space time, okay? So it's, we, can, we need to understand this car space background method as a, as a convenient tool. So if you think in this way, well, even if you do not, uh, it's not the only way we can use to, to couple uh, uh, fermions or electrons or other degrees of freedom to, to elasticity. And this is what I wanted to discuss in this part of, uh, of the talk. So just uh, more, not so sophisticated and more, a little bit more Lyman way of, of, of coupling uh, electrons in a, in a crystal uh, using the uh, more conventional type binding approach, conventional in, in, in solid state physics. So what I want to do is to just to review, briefly review how this uh, type binding uh, method works in, in, in solids, something that you all know, but probably much better than, than I. But as I say, is the, is the starting point from, from introducing a string. So first of all, we have this, um, um, the, the, our beloved uh, uh, Schrodinger equation, and we assume that the potential filled by, by electrons, by the electrons is 
something periodic. And we can approximate this periodic uh, potential as essentially the sum of the atomic potential at each side of the, of the lattice, of the crystal, okay? It's shifted by, by the position of the, of the atom. Essentially, the tight binding approach tells you that the wave function, the, the, the block by, by wave function, is going to be proportional to a linear combination of the atomic orbitals, those ones that we want to consider in, in our tight binding. So say this is a linear combination of, in terms of position and the type of how many orbitals we want to consider and some coefficient that we want to compute. So if we apply this wave function in the, the Schrodinger equations, we have to face with some integrals at the end of the day. There are two types of integrals that we constantly neglect, essentially that orbitals are going to be approximately uh, orthonormal, and we're going to neglect complications, okay? So if you do that, this is how this Hamiltonian looks like, okay? So you have on-site energies in terms of the coefficient we want to compute, but in, in, real, in the real space, in terms of the position of the, of the atoms. There, this is the, the crystal field splitting, which essentially is nothing that, but how the parameters, uh, how the, the overlap interval changes uh, when you consider the extra potential coming from the, the surrounding atoms. So this is the, the, how this crystal field splitting looks like, okay? So essentially it's a local term, and essentially this, how this, the normalization of the, uh, of, the, of the orbital changes when you consider extra uh, potentials in the surrounding. Also, we can consider spin orbit coupling, which in, in short can be viewed as another part of this crystal field splitting. And finally, we have these hopping terms. So since I is, hopping terms is how electrons go from one, uh, one side of the, of the lattice to the other. But in terms of integral, it's essentially how, what is the, inter, the overlap interval between some orbital and some position and how it goes to the to the to the other position okay if we are in equilibrium essentially this difference is some some uh, lattice lattice vector okay but imagine what happens when we start to distort the, to distort the, this lattice so now this the difference between these two atoms is not exactly some lattice vector but it's something which is slightly deformed okay so uh, Essentially, if this distortion is not too big, so remember, the, from atom to atom, the distortion is not, is not, we assume it is not big, but if we consider the cumulative effect from several atoms away, this could be as big as it, it allows, okay? It's like an integration. Okay, coming back to this, to this cartoon, essentially you have some atom, you have another atom, which are displaced from this equilibrium position. And essentially you consider how this, in the case of this uh, hopping integral, how this integral, changes when you consider this displacement. Well, what you have to do first is just to consider that they, th those orbitals are not, as, are not evaluated at the same places as they were in the in equilibrium, okay? So this is now this distance, okay? And also you have to consider that the, the orbitals now in the interval, we are assuming of course that the atomic orbital, the, the atomic potential, sorry, is, is spherically symmetric, so it is not gonna be the star, but it's better if we consider this plot. Okay, so if we a little bit change this orientation, we see that the two orbitals due to this change in the position are misoriented. Okay, so we have to consider both this change of length and this misorientation between orbitals. Okay, essentially in mathematical grounds, it's essentially it only means that we are uh, making an integral from some frame in some atom and some uh, rotated frame in, in another atom, okay? And if this angle is not so big, okay, we can expand this, this rotation matrix in terms of this, of this angle, of this vector, okay? That tells you how much these two, uh, these two uh, atoms or these two orbitals are rotated. Okay, what is the relation between this angle as, and, the, and the strain, which is the, the important fact? Well, we know from continuum, me continuum mechanics that when you consider some, uh, fluid part, uh, piece of fluid, so you can deform. Yeah? And if this deformation uh, conserves uh, volume, essentially you can divide into, first, essentially you can take, consider this part of this deformation as a rotation, okay? So essentially you can take this deformation and you can rotate in one of the axes to, to put in the, in the correct frame. And then you see that the, the, this, uh, the, what is left 
is essentially proportional to the variation of the displacement in one direction and the, with respect to the variation in the perpendicular direction. So in a sense, in short, this, this angle is proportional to the off diagonal part of the, of the, of the strain. Or essentially, it, this angle is dual to the, to the shear strain. Okay, so we can substitute the shear strain here. Then if we combine that, we change the, the length uh, between the, the distance between the two atoms at this orientation is proportional to the shear strain. Essentially, we can do some kind of perturbation theory. Uh, we, can, uh, we can find that the changes in the hopping terms is essentially at very at lowest order in, in, in a strain proportional to the what already had before and some deviation which are proportional to the to the strain tensor in the form of, of a change in the bond length and the misorientation between orbitals okay well this is not new okay this is the what uh, i should have put the right name this is the nothing but the the slater coster way of of introducing a strain in the in in a tight binding environment but uh, just to Remind that the, also we had this this crystal thick splitting, which is essentially how these two some orbitals within each atom uh, interact with each other due to the surrounding. But essentially, due to a strain, it's easy to convince that uh, yourself that uh, it's going to change as well. Essentially, you're, because this you have this this difference, which before in the clearing was a lattice vector, now it's uh, something different. So you have to expand this. Uh, this potential in terms of the spin tensor, and you find modification of the of the crystal field splitting. Okay, but essentially this is a kind of renormalization of local terms in the in the Hamiltonian. Uh, to see how this this scheme works is is very instructive to 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 see how it works for a simple square lattice made of its orbitals. Okay, this was done well. The, the first reference I know I'm aware of of this calculation was done in, in this one that is, was later of repeating this or this other one reference. But in the sense, you have two uh, Hamiltonians on with one single orbital per unit cell, and you are considering hopping to to, to nearest neighbor uh, to nearest neighbor, which is denoted by T naught. And we want to consider also hopping to the next to nearest neighbors. Okay, so for hopping to in the diagonal orbital. It's going to be clear in a, in a second. Okay, if you consider the undistorted uh, lattice, you have this is your Hamiltonian, is, and you can Fourier transform and you get something which is very familiar. So then you can expand this, this, this Hamiltonian in this function in terms of the momenta around uh, the, the gamma point, and you get the, the standard k over square, k square over 2m uh, Hamiltonian. But now you consider how a strain enters. Uh, using the, the, the method I described, briefly described before, you have uh, essentially changing the hopping due to, um, to the changes in the, in the length. So this is how this T naught, this hopping to nearest neighbors changes. And you also have changes in the next to nearest neighbors. And because this V1 and V2 are not, or uh, well, they're orthogonal, but they, they are different from this, uh, the, 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 our basic. Uh, Frame, you also get uh, changes in the in the hopping in the next to nearest neighbor hopping due to uh, share the of diagonal part of the of the string. Okay, you put all this all together in your Hamiltonian. Essentially, you you trade these t's by this strain of t's, and you expand again in around gamma using the undistorted block states. This is what you get. Okay, so essentially you get something which is quadratic in momenta uh, as before. But you have extra terms that you can very nicely uh, write in terms of a kind of metric tensor. Okay, so this metric tensor looks like this one. Okay, this the undistorted part plus something with that depends on the straight tensor, which is uh, pretty similar to what we expected from uh, from the local Galileo invariant uh, theory. This is good, but it's not exactly uh, what we will guess because we have extra terms in the in the diagonal part, but in any case, it's pretty similar to what you get from uh, assuming that you, 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 are, you are connecting non-relativistic Fermi in a cast background. 
So we want to explore more this, uh, this, this method. And uh, what we did uh, some time ago was to consider a type binding model for, for two-dimensional double gain insulator introduced by Hughes, Bernabic, and Frank. And as I said, this is a, nothing but a condensed matter realization of the Wilson fermion, for you who are familiar with the lattice field theory. And as I say, in this Hamiltonian, you get S orbitals, these blue balls, and P, um, P orbital, sorry, which is this, this uh, pink, I guess, uh, or this uh, magenta uh, orbitals. And you consider hobbies between them. Also, it's important that you are considering different energy for these two orbitals. And of course, you need to consider spin orbit coupling. And if you assume that the spin orbit coupling is very large, uh, the rest is a story. So you, they, from this three, dimension, three orbital model, you can go to a two dimensional model. And if you consider a spin, uh, the two, Flavors of spin, you end up with uh, the famous uh, uh, Dirac Hamiltonian for a two dimensional topological insulator. Okay. And beta, alpha and beta are the, the, the Dirac matrices. Now, if you want to go to, uh, to three dimensions, then you, you can take the approach of Vulcan and Valence and consider these two, a stack of these two dimensional uh, uh, topological insulator systems and couple these layers through a time reversal breaking uh, hopping term. Uh, the time reversal symmetry broken term is, is denoted by this, this uh, non-trivial phase factor here. So as I said, you can put all together, sorry, and you can, uh, depending on how you move this, this parameter, you can go from a three-dimensional topological insulator, depending on these parameters, how they behave, to a bisemimetal phase, okay? Where these two, essentially these two bands cross each other, forming the F point. But it's important that this is a, we, we, are, we can get a, a, a type binding model for a bicycle meta using this, uh, with this was already done by Burkhoff and Valens. Now we are ready to apply this machinery of, uh, of uh, how the hopping changes by, change by, by strain. And I mean, I'm gonna save you a lot of time. And essentially this is what you get if you follow the, the, the recipe. The, the, the result is, is something that uh, is very remarkable that if you do this, this uh, expansion of the, uh, of the hoppings in terms of the strain and you expand around the, uh, the Dirac point, this is what you get. So this, this is the effective Hamiltonian for, to first order in the strain. The first thing you get is the usual uh, deformation potential, which is proportional to the unity uh, matrix, which is essentially the the density, but also to first order in, in, in the string tensor, you find that the, the strain couples to, to, to wild fermions through a chiral vector potential. Okay, so the, the details you can find in this paper, but essentially uh, this is the form this, uh, this vector field looks like in a, in a similar way as it happens in graphene, but for different reasons. So how we know that this is uh, essentially right? Because uh, if you go to, so you consider symmetry constraints, we know that those, uh, sorry, those points that appear in the middle of nowhere in the billion zone are not constrained by symmetry. So they appear away from any time reversal symmetric point. So essentially the only symmetry we have is the, the full rotation symmetry. This is essentially why uh, this, this Hamiltonian mimics the, the, the bile, Semi metals. Of course, you can change the, the, the parameters and you can deform the Hamiltonian to get some, uh, uh, some, uh, some deviation from, 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 uh, from invariance over rotation. But if you rescale momenta, essentially, this is what you get. And if you apply this symmetry constant, which is essentially known, the, 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 the answer is, uh, I mean, the, the, to, to get the, how this response enters in the, in the Hamiltonian is, is essentially you get these vectors and you get these tensors and you have to combine them to get the scalar. So essentially if I combine this, combine this vector, which is the momentum, I can combine with the, matri the policy matrices, which are another vector with respect to, uh, to rotations. And this is what you get, which is the original Hamiltonian, the sigma dot K. Also, you can consider the trace of the strain tensor and you can combine with sigma naught, which is a scalar, which is the, the identity matrix, and you have a deformation potential. Now, you can combine this strain tensor, this is a two rank index uh, tensor, 
with, uh, for instance, the Pauli matrix and the separation of this k vector, the, separa the nodal point, the, the vector in the region zone where the nodal point is. And this is the two terms you can get, which is essentially these two ve these vector like coupling I mentioned before. Also, you can go in higher order in, in momenta and, and in, straight, in, in the same tensor, and then you can combine this and you can get these two terms, which is essentially in terms of 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 uh, of a low energy uh, effective model is the uh, some connection Fermi uh, this spin connection on the Fermi velocity connection okay and you can go to higher orders as well also if you consider some systems that uh, with in, uh, inversion uh, symmetry is broken essentially you can place the two by nodes at different energies and these energies are is described by this is denoted by this V naught. So say under these conditions, you can apply all this machinery I described before, and you can get a, a temporal component of this vector field, which is also chiral. This means the chirality of this vector field. Also, you can go to, as I mentioned, to higher higher order terms in the derivative expansion, and you can mimic essentially with this this method the the, the introduction of field binds and the, and connections. That's something um, perhaps you you can find this is interesting. There is no trivial way to find a, 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 connect, a spin connection in, the, in this method, okay? So essentially the, with this, the deformation procedure and the type binding model, what you can get is something which is related to the distortional for this uh, viscosity as was described by two days ago. Okay, now we know that the, essentially uh, elasticity enters as a, as a chiral vector field we the rest is a story essentially we can apply the what we know or we know about anomalies and we know that this the triangle anomalies is not only concerned just a single uh, insertion of a chiral vector but this anomalies also happens when you have three uh three insertion of this uh, chiral chiral current and this is essentially this is what you get uh chen simon like terms in terms of this chiral, chiral vector field that uh, for us is this vector field the coefficient, of, uh, of course, is different. It's, it's a one third of different. Now, if you apply the, the expressions I put before and you write everything in terms of the of this uh, separation, uh, the nodal separation of these elastic vector fields, this is what you get. Essentially, you get something which is a whole viscosity, and is uh, anti-symmetric when you under the exchange of these two in this, this pairs of indices. And essentially, we can read off the, the coefficient, the whole viscosity coefficient from these, from the from by semi metals essentially because it's something proportional to the to the anomalous whole conductivity, the topologic, the, well not quantized but the, this topological in origin uh, whole conductivity multiplied by essentially three three powers of the of the modulus of the separation momentum. And this is a nice illustration of what I I said before is that. Okay, this is a, a, a very apparent way of, of coupling uh, and finding a whole viscosities in terms of response of restraints that do not resort on, on does not resort on, uh, on curved space times. As I say, we, we see that the, the elasticity couples as a chiral vector field, and from this expression, we can read the, how the stress tensor looks like, looks like in, in our systems. Of course, we cannot say that this stress tensor now is the spatial part of the strain energy momentum tensor, okay? And also, essentially, you can compute the viscosities from, from using the cube approach by computing this, essentially, this correlation function. And from the same token, you can compute the, the dissipative viscosities from the bubble diagram, okay? And as I told you, this, this was done using a tight binding approach, but I mean, it's compatible with, with symmetry. Okay, to go a little bit further in this discussion, it's, it's also instructive to think in something I, did, I said before. So I told you that in, in two-dimensional systems that are invariant under rotations, you can construct an anti-symmetric four-rank tensor in terms of the Kronecker delta and the levy civita symbol, okay? But what happens when we go to two dimensions to three dimensions from two dimension to three dimension? Essentially, the the, the Kronecker symbol, uh, the delta Kronecker is the same. It's a two rank tensor, but now the Lebesgue symbol acquires an extra index. So essentially, you cannot 
generalize this expression for uh, three-dimensional rotational invariant systems? You cannot. So the thing you can do is just to take some uh, vector field, or better to say a pseudo vector field, to contract this extra index and get something which is uh, four-dimensional, uh, four rank. This is essentially the what is behind this expression I, I wrote before. Okay. So essentially, uh, you remember, uh, as I told you, the um, sorry, uh, here, the whole viscosity is proportional to this three four rank tensor with one index context with the with the with the nodal separation. So, in a sense, from from this very trivial remark. We cannot we can we, we cannot expect to find uh, uh, whole viscosities in three dimensional rotational invariant systems, and if we do, uh, we need to add something that breaks this uh, three dimensional invariant system, uh, this three dimensional invariance under rotation. So say by putting an explicit vector in one direction. So there is a natural question then, which is okay. Is, are there any ways of breaking this this uh, this uh, invariance under rotation in three dimensions? For instance, is there what happens if we go from O3 to so this uh, this uh, rotation symmetry to a octahedra group, for instance, which is what something that was uh, asked, uh, wondered in this in this reference. Well, there is another way, another reason to that motivates this this question is what I told you before is that now we uh, since this this reference this this groundbreaking uh, work. We know that there are other topological semi metals in the in the applied round. Since so we have five semi metals where there's a single band crossing, but now we have this multifold fermion when we have multi, uh, several bands crossing at the nodal point. So we have three fold fermions, four fold fermions, and those extra, uh, contrary to what happens to five semi metals, these, uh, these multifold crossings need to be, uh, need to be. Um, Protected by some symmetry, so we expect to, the, them to happen on some high symmetry points in the in the Beyond zone, for instance, in the gamma point. And there are few uh, 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 crystalline groups uh, that uh, have these these band crosses. We know which ones uh, since uh, the appearance of this of this paper. In particular, in what follows, I'm gonna follow. I wanna uh, describe a little bit this uh, space group um, uh, 198. Of course, breaking the universal symmetry. Otherwise, we do we do not expect the whole whole viscosity to, to happen. Okay, going back to to this uh, naive description I told you before that in terms of the full symmetry group in three dimensions. So as I told you, in three dimensions we have the delta Kronecker and the Liberty Civita symbol with an extra index. But what ha what happens if we will go from from this O3 group to the octahedral group, which is essentially the cubic group because they are uh, dual bodies? Is something I learned. When preparing this talk, okay. Uh, from, if we go from this from this group, full symmetry group, to, to this hot group, we we learn that there are different uh, irreducible tensors, uh, two rank tensor in this rep for this representation that was found by by Inigo and Barry and, and Pronab in, in this reference. So say you have a different list of of irreducible irreducible tensors, both symmetric and anti-symmetric, uh, sorry, uh, symmetric tensors, then you can build uh, a whole viscosity. And it happens that when you combine this, this irreducible tensor, it, you, you are able to, to build up a four-rank tensor, which is anti-symmetric. And this is the, essentially the expression. This is the two possibilities you get when you combine these, these, these tensors and the Levi-Civita tensor, okay? So, and there are no more in, in, for this uh, hot group. As I say, for, from symmetry considerations, we are able to find or we are able to expect to, to expect some whole viscosity for rank tensor uh, that can by, can be divided in two coefficients. Okay, and of course, this this coefficient, the, the, the value of this coefficient, strongly depends on the material and the system and even the model you consider. This is why we use this this uh, this uh, hot tidal group, this 198 group with. Uh, this there are four uh, actually there are eight atoms uh, per unit cell, but we are focusing on the uh, some orbital s orbitals in the rhodium atoms, and from these four uh, s orbitals in the position of the rhodium, we can build up a, a type binding model. And of course, we need to break the universal symmetry, adding some flux in some direction. So essentially, this is you get 
around the gamma point, uh, threefold Fermi. Of course, uh, you, your system is four dimensional because you have four orbitals. So you, around gamma point, you can project uh, this high energy orbital and you end up with something which is something is familiar for, for you, which is essentially something pretty similar to, to the Dirac Hamiltonian, but instead of these poly matrices, something with this string one matrices fulfilling the, the SU2 algebra. So there are two sets in the Gel, uh, murray gelman matrices to, that fulfill this algebra. And as I said, this gives us a uh, threefold degeneracy in the, in the system. Okay, if you go through the details, uh, you can find the details in the paper. So you can expand the hopping, the hopping terms. Remember, we are considering S-type orbitals. And if you consider only nearest neighbor hoppings, I mean, going beyond is a kind of nightmare. This is essentially what you get. Okay, so we can, I can, let me uh, skip the details. So essentially from this, this procedure I described before using type binding, you can find uh, these uh, components of this stress tension in terms of the, of the, 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 the Gelman matrices. From this, you can compute the whole viscosity, these two coefficients, and in this particular case, you can find that this eta two, this the second coefficient is zero, and this is an artifact from the from the oversimplified model. Of course, so you can consider an extra hopping. Probably you can get a, a non-zero value here, and also you can get a non-zero value of this uh, first coefficient, so this whole coefficient. So essentially, uh, of course, it's going to depend on the cutoff for for obvious reasons. What is important is that this tell us that this, uh, this uh, assumption is, is, is true. So we can, break, uh, we can break this full rotation symmetry to other uh, cubic groups or to other crystalline groups and to get to expect different uh, whole viscosity, of course, breaking the universal symmetry. And as I say, was published here. So uh, I don't know how much time I do I have uh, because I can skip the last, time, the last part. Two so minutes. Can you, how much, sorry? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, okay. So I'm gonna skip this part, although it's interesting saying that you can, you can uh, generalize somehow uh, all what I described in terms of the strain tensor to optical phonons, okay? Essentially, the, the, the main difference is that, uh, well, if you go through the details, you can, you can find that it's happening in graphene that uh, uh, optical displacement, optical phonons also coupled to, to bi-semi metals in some particular cases as a vector field, okay? So this is the expression we got in this paper. This is, this is not general, this is not universal as it, it, it was for in the case of, of a, the case of a strain, but we expect some, some systems to, to, to fulfill this condition to have this vector representation of the optical phonons. And with this, you can integrate out fermions and you can get a, some a kind of a equivalent a response to the whole viscosity in system, for instance, in the personal magnetic field. As I said, you can generalize this four rank tensor, this whole viscosity, to a two rank tensor, anti symmetric as well, but that tells you how it couples to optical phonons. Okay, we compute uh, as a function of the magnetic field, although not needed, but you know, uh, you have this, the same response you, coming from the same diagram. And in principle, this can be observed in experiments. That was the motivation for, for this work. So, with this, let me finish uh, just, uh, just writing the, the summary and, well, thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Alberto, for this nice talk. So, we have time for some questions. May I start? Yes. Uh Go yeah, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. I, I love this uh, connection between general relativity and curved backgrounds and quantum field theory and solid states, as you know. Um, yeah, I, you said at some stage this is this more or less known result, um, uh, Slater Costa, but it was not known for me in that form in the three dimensional. Uh, I used to study this in, uh, in graphene, so it was two dimensional always. So I'm a bit confused. So you can, at one hand side, you, you had to summer these orbitals, which are like ortho, orthogonal, like cross formed orbitals. Do you have that? You mean in which slide? Oh, it was it was slide? Yeah. 
point. Yeah, something like this, more or less. Yes. Okay. So essentially, you can also have, in principle, you can also have rotations of the orbitals, right? Or how do you? Yeah, this that? is essentially what this term uh, looks like. This is what I, instead of using this 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 cartoon, I use this one. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. essentially, you are integrating over over the position. You can place the, this picture in this way, and in this way, you see that the, these two orbitals that otherwise in the in equilibrium they were perfectly oriented. As you know, for instance, that happened in graphene for these, these pi orbitals. If you consider distortion, these, these two orbitals are no longer uh, oriented. I mean, oriented in the way that they minimize energy. Okay, so this is why you have to consider one atom in some frame, reference frame, and a different orbital in a different atoms in a different frame. Okay, and this essentially this, this is why you have to compute this integral, this, this hopping integrals. Just writing the two orbitals. This is the two orbitals are uh, in different positions, uh, or uh, misoriented. And this misorientation is is uh, are introduced by this uh, this uh, rotation matrix. Okay, so this misorientation, this this lack of of of, of uh, orientation is represented by B. And essentially, you can relate this term to to the shear strain. Okay. So I noticed that the whole deformation theory, as I know it, it works up to first order, and then it's very nice one-to-one -one correspondence with the curvature and so on. So also here for the rotations, uh, is it the same? So that it is like first order approximation? Yeah, essentially it's because, uh, well, this is this picture, right? So essentially you, any deformation, you can decompose in a rotation, mm -hmm. right? And yes. a shear deformation, mm -hmm. okay? A rotation is when you take the, the two atoms and you, you rotate in the same direction, both of them. So uh, in, this, in this regard, uh, a whole rotation doesn't affect too much. It's this relative misorientation. It's the relative uh, rotation between the two atoms, what matters. Mm -hmm. So essentially, is, this is why when you consider rotation, in, this, that happens when you consider string in graphene. Well, Maria knows this better than me. When you consider this deformation in graphene, there is a term coming from this rotation of the frames. That essentially you can integrate out. There is no, well, according to, to, to this theory, there is no uh, net effect on the on the band structure. But this misorientation is nothing but this integral is no longer the same because essentially they are putting some uh, let's call pi orbitals in different uh, in different coordinates. So essentially you do not expect to have the same value for the for the hopping integral. I don't know if this answers your question. Okay, yeah, I think, so. yeah. But essentially this is in, in the Slater cluster. Uh, I mean, this, they call this term is this V pi pi and this V pi pi S or this, they call this name times this cosine director. So sine director. So this, uh, the, the, the notation is a little bit different, but I, I think it's, it's conventional in, in this Slater cluster theory. As I say, I'm just using a more fancy way of describing things. Yes, okay, thank you. Do Eduardo have another question? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Really, really nice talk. Uh, I, was want <laughs> I, I was wondering, do you know if there's any signature of this whole viscosity to, uh, in the edge? Uh, what I mean is that you present the, um, the ball Hamilton, right? Yes. So then if you have the edge or as or the board the the boundary, yeah, the boundary what is yeah. happening do you know no, have no an insight okay. uh, well essentially you can do i mean imagine you consider this this uh, this square lattice hamiltonian for this uh, type banding uh, this type banding model for this uh, topological insulator in two dimensions and essentially this is easy this is a square lattice right yes. and you you can consider a ribbon yes okay Essentially, it's a natural modification, or, or as a, you can use essentially this, this, this Hamiltonian. Okay. okay, and the question is that you have to be a little bit careful of how much the distortion happens in the in the boundaries with respect to the ball, because you know that there are energetic considerations that the at the boundary you expect more deformation than that in the ball because there are less atoms to be deformed uh, in, at the boundaries, and so. But in principle, you can use this. For instance, people has used uh, similar this this method in for to consider graphene nanoribbons, right? Yeah. So 
So instead of considering the, this Hamiltonian for graphene and ribbon, you consider this Hamiltonian, this side banding Hamiltonian for this material, and you take a lot of, uh, you, can, you, have a, you take a stack of, of those ribbons in order to make a, 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 a big ribbon in three dimensions. But essentially, you can apply this, this method and you can, you can see how this uh, Hamiltonian changes with respect to, to, with, the, with respect to the strain. Also, you have to remember that the, the phonons at the boundaries are pretty different when at, that phonons at the, at the bulk, okay? Yeah, that's- But uh, as what confirms the, the, the electronic response, you can apply this, but in real space. You cannot go to Fourier uh, transforming, to the Fourier transform. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So, any other question? So this elastic uh, gauge field you introduce in the Hamiltonian is another possibility to induce uh, a wild semi-metal phase from a Dirac semi-metal, right? So as, uh, well, in principle, you need yeah. to be a wild semi-metal, right? Okay. So if you mean Dirac as a time reversal symmetric completion of a wild semi-metal, uh, you need uh, to have first uh, uh, yeah, points. nodal points. However. If you consider a, a three-dimensional topoic insulator, like, like in, in this case, you can apply this, this machinery. Mm. The, the only point is that the, at the, the at low energies around the, the, the gamma point, it will not look like a, a vector field. It's gonna look like, like another thing. Okay. The changes in the, in the mass term due to strain, something like this, but in principle, it's a vector mm. field, it's a chiral vector field because you expand around the gamma point. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so any other question? So uh, we thank again uh, to Alberto for this nice talk. Thank you very much, Alberto. So uh, we go to the next speaker, which is Professor Cesar Fosco.